many of us made, took, made New Year's resolutions. And um, my wife and I have noticed that especially as I get older, it become, it's become increasingly difficult to change my behavior. <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think many of my colleagues from the foundation would probably attest to that as well. But I don't know what I would do without my bathroom scale. So the, making a resolution is one thing. But that happens January 1st, or maybe that actually happens New Year's Eve. But the hard work of making it happen requires day-to-day -day vigilance and regular, repeated feedback. And that requires the bathroom scale. So over the next few years, we're going to need to see behavior change on a massive scale. So it's obvious, but it needs to be said, dramatically different outcomes for students will require dramatically more effective instruction from adults. But we can't be surprised or discouraged when we find that that behavior change is much more difficult for the adults than it ever has been for the students. That's why I like this analogy of the bathroom scale, though. Because this is not just about accountability. This is not just about more bureaucracy, although I know sometimes it sounds that way. This is about giving teachers the feedback that they need to manage their own resolutions, to do the hard work of staying on track to raising the quality of, of their own practice. So as many of you know in this room, that's hard, um, complicated work. But we have to figure out how to do this right because we will not get dramatically different results for students without dramatically changing day-to-day -day instruction. And as we know from any sort of other study of adult behavior change, we're not gonna get dramatic changes in day-to-day -day instruction without a regular form of feedback uh, for teachers. So, Developing a new teacher evaluation and feedback system, I think is the most important piece of infrastructure that we could be building for schools. And especially with, um, with the Common Core Standards coming in the next uh, few years, this is gonna be even more important than, than we can imagine, I think, right now. So before we, I'm, much of what I'm going to be doing today is summarizing the latest uh, findings, but before we get into the lost in the details of the latest set of findings, I just want to highlight probably the most important thing that we're going to be talking about uh, today, and that is we set out to see could you combine data from student surveys, classroom observations, and a teacher's track record of student achievement gains, and learn something about a teacher's practice, to be able to actually tell a teacher where they stand in terms of their ability to raise student achievement. And the headline story should be, we've learned you can do that. And we've seen how, how you can do that. Now, hopefully in future years, we'll see improvements. Um, but with the random assignment results that I'm going to start out with talking about today, we've seen that it is possible to identify groups of teachers using these measures who do raise student achievement. And the goal is to start from there and use it as a bathroom scale to try to encourage and promote 
the kinds of behavior changes that our education you know, sector needs for the, for the years ahead. So first, just a quick, uh, really quick overview of, of the basic design of the study. We designed MET to go out and test a range of different measures. So we collected classroom observations in, for, you know, in 3,000 classrooms using digital video. Then we had ETS, our partners who are here today, trained 900 people to use five different instruments for rating those, those videos that, that we had collected. We, um, we collected student surveys from 44,000 plus uh, students that, that first year. And we measured student achievement, not just on the state test, but on the supplemental tests that, that we gave that in math required, we used the balanced assessment in math that required uh, kids to demonstrate their conceptual understanding. In English language arts, we used the open-ended version of the Stanford 9 reading test, which requires kids to write short answer questions. Now, for, the, um, for the, some of the results that I'll be talking about today, we went back and we asked a number of, of principals and peers in Hillsborough County, Florida, to observe an, another set of videos because we wanted to test whether the observation scores that they produced could be re reliable. Um, and I'll, I'll report some of those results in a second. So the first two reports, the first year focused on student surveys. The second one focused on classroom observation. It's, and in both of them, we said, how do the measures that, that emerge from these student surveys and the classroom observations, how are they related to student achievement gains? The first one focused on, okay, we've shown that, that these student surveys and the classroom observations identify teachers whose student achievement gains appear to be higher, but are we identifying teachers who are truly exceptional in their practice, or are we just finding teachers who have exceptional students? The only way to answer that question, rather than just try to control for an increasingly long list of, of student background uh, controls, was to do random assignment. So, to find out, we randomly assigned classrooms to 1,591 teachers. And the basic way it worked was we asked principals or we asked school systems to use their scheduling software to identify rosters of students for each class. So we had 1,591 of these rosters. Then we, our, our partners at RAND, randomly assigned each of those rosters to a different teacher within a given grade and subject. Then we actually predicted what kinds of student outcomes we would expect to see based on the data we had collected from the first year. So um, we used the data from the first year to form our initial impression of each of these teachers' practice. And we wanted to test whether that initial impression was, was right or not. To do that, then, at step four, we compared those predictions to the actual differences in practice. Now, I've gone through this, de this detail just so that you know, because this random assignment only occurred within schools, the, the comparisons we're doing are within schools. We're saying, can these measures help you identify teachers who, um, who are more or less successful in promoting student achievement uh, gains within, um, within a given school. First, following random assignment in year two, the teachers with greater measured effectiveness from year one did produce higher student achievement. That's sort of a big deal, folks, because I've, uh, I've been a, uh, a, I got my PhD oh, 22 years ago, and I could probably count on one hand 
the number of times I've been able to use the word cause. Social scientists don't get to use the word cause anymore. But actually, now we get to use the word cause in this case. Because of the random assignment, we could say we identified groups of teachers who caused greater student achievement to happen. That's, sort of a, that's a big deal. Second, the magnitude of the impacts were consistent with the predictions. So one is a big deal by itself, but two is combined with number one is also a big deal. Three, those teachers who produced higher achievements on the state tests also produced higher achievement on the supplemental assessments. In fact, the impacts in terms of student level standard deviations were about 70% as large on the, on the supplemental assessments as they were on the, on the state assessments. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words, and so um, I think the best way to sort of illustrate some of these key findings are, are with a graph. So this graph is for um, fourth to eighth grade math. This represents the data for 800 teachers. So um, each dot represents a group of, a, of about 40 uh, uh, teachers. So we ranked teachers according to their, you know, grouped teachers according to their predicted e effectiveness from the first year. That's what the X, the horizontal axis, is measuring. And the vertical axis is measuring their actual difference in achievement that, that emerged following random assignment. That dashed line is not the fitted line, although it turns out the fitted line would be pretty much on top of that. That dashed line is the line where the actual achievement gains that we saw uh, for each of those, which are 20 groups of 40 teachers each, um, was equal to uh, predicted. And as you can see, many of those points are, are right along or right near that line of actual equals uh, uh, predicted. Now this, the second graph is for English language arts. And this, the thing to notice here is that many of the dots are, um, are also close to that actual equals predicted line. But I'm using the same scale as I used for the math chart, and you should notice that the top 5% of teachers in English language arts are not as different from the bottom of 5% of teachers in English language arts as they were in, in math. That's a common finding that many people um, uh, have reported, and, and we found it too. Okay. The second set of results um, I want to talk about focus on classroom observations. So when we released the report last year, many people said, hey, look, okay, so you've shown that ETS can train 900 people to do these observations, but they didn't have any personal relationship with the people they're observing. Could principals who been to lunch and maybe, you know, been on school picnics or been in lots of contentious faculty meetings with these teachers, also apply the same, same instruments. And what about peers and how many observations do, would you need to do in a school context by a principal and a peer to achieve similar levels of reliability? So to answer that question, we asked teachers in Hillsboro to collect 25 um, different lessons last spring. And we recruited a group of their principals and other school administrators to score those videos. So, so they're scoring videos for their own teachers as well as teachers from other schools. And in addition, we recruited a group of peer observers from Hillsborough to do some of the observations. Now, Hillsborough does a particularly good job training and certifying observers. So we didn't, we didn't supplement that in any way. We did provide some training on how to use the video scoring software, but 
we relied on the training for using their Danielson-based rubric, using the training that, that Hillsborough just normally uh, provided to their observer. But here I'm just calling out, this is just the eight of the competencies from the Danielson instrument. And this is actually one of the most common things I'm asked in cocktail party discussions about the Measures of Effective Teaching Project. What do you look for when you walk into a classroom? What is it that really great teachers are do doing? And what this instrument is, is an attempt to be systematic about what are the types of things to look for. And in fact, one of them is questioning or discussion techniques. So a teacher would get low scores, unsatisfactory scores on the Dan Danielson instrument if they ask a series of yes-no questions posed in rapid order, if the teacher is, is um, uh, originating and uh, receiving all, you know, all of the questions, if the, if the teacher is moderating all of the questions, and if there's a same small group of students involved. A teacher would get a high score if the, all the questions expect students to explain their understanding of something because it's only if you bring students' understanding to the surface will you be able to build on it. And um, if the students start to originate some of the questions. So it is possible to try to get a little bit more systematic about how you do a classroom observation, but you can see there's no way to wring the judgment completely out of these instruments, that, that there's necessarily some judgment involved. And what we wanted to do with this was to say, well, okay, how many observations, given that there are differences in judgment, um, and given that scores may vary from lesson to lesson, how many observations by what kinds of raters do you need to do to achieve reliability? So rather than dumb down the instrument by focusing on trivial things that are easy to measure, we're saying, okay, generate reliability by averaging um, across more than one um, observation. And, and the point of this study was to say, well, how, mu how many observations would you have to average over and by whom? So here are some of the things we found. First, adding an observation by a second observer increases reliability twice as much as having the same observer score an additional lesson. I'll show you a graph in a second for what, what concretely what that means. Second, Short observations may provide a time-efficient way to incorporate more than one observer per teacher. So we had some of these video lessons scored just after 15 minutes. I know that's an extremely short um, observation, uh, but we, we knew that, that if districts are gonna have to do multiple observations, potentially by multiple observers, they're going to need some ways to, to try to um, do it in a time-efficient way. And what we learned was that in a 15-minute observation, you could get about 60% of the reliability that you get with a full lesson observation. But you do it in you know, roughly one-third of the observation time. So as a way to supplement some fuller uh, observations. So actually in the report, you'll see it, we highlight the fact that there are some parts of the Danielson instrument where you'd get a biased estimate of, of a teacher's practice if all you did was watch 15 minutes. So just aside from reliability, you would get a biased impression, for instance, of a teacher's questioning skills if all you watched was 15 minutes. So we're not saying all observations should just be 15 minutes. What we're saying is if you're having some full length observations, one way to boost reliability would be to supplement those full length observations by short observations by additional observers. Third, we saw that principles, 
and other school administrators rate their own teachers higher than do outside observers. But their ratings were highly correlated with the ratings that others um, gave for those same teachers. That, that was really important because if an observer is showing up in for an observation thinking about the last um, contentious discussion they had with that teacher in the last faculty meeting or thinking about the fact that they're going to be going to that teacher's kids you know wedding next you know Saturday so personal biases either positive or negative that could distract them and that could mean that 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 the things that they're seeing in the videos have less to do with the practice than they do with the actual instruction. But that's not what we saw, is that even though principals do rate their own teachers somewhat higher, the once you adjust for measurement error, the correlation between their ratings and what other administrators see in their same teachers is 0.87. So it's very highly correlated with what other observers would see watching the same lessons. That's a really important uh, um, finding. Second, um, administrators did, in Hillsborough did discern bigger differences between teachers than peers did. Now, we have no, I, no uh, way of knowing exactly why this was the case, but it was reflected in the fact that the administrators were more likely to use both the top and the bottom category than peers were. The underlying differences they were seeing was, was wider for, um, for administrators than it was for peers. And as a result, reliability was a little bit higher for administrators than it was for peers. But it's not due to the measurement error, it's due to the, the magnitude of the underlying differences in practice discerned. Fourth, now this was sort of, we got a, this was sort of an accidental uh, uh, thing we were able to test. So uh, when we were recruiting teachers for the project, teachers in Hillsborough said, okay, we'll let you watch our videos, but we get to pick which videos our administrators see. We said, fine, but the peers get to see any of your videos. Now, the wonderful thing that that allowed us uh, uh, to do was be able to compare the lessons that the teachers chose to show their administrators to the lessons that the teachers chose not to show their administrators. And we got to see both sets of lessons from the eyes of the peers. Now, of course, we didn't tell the peers, okay, here was a lesson that they have, the teacher has chosen to show their administrator, but we could, we could look at the scores. And here's what we found. Their average score on the chosen videos was higher, but the differences in underlying practice were also higher. So, moreover, once we controlled for measurement error in, in both the scores on the chosen and the unchosen videos, the correlation between a teacher score on their chosen and their unchosen videos was effectively one. So, the same teachers who were struggling in the unchosen videos were the same teachers who were struggling in the chosen videos. Now, one reason why this is important is it's, when you think about it, this is sort of an extreme form of prior notification. That, um, that by, in fact, it's even, rather than telling somebody beforehand that you're going to show up in their classroom, you let them see afterwards how it went and then decide whether or not to submit it. And what we're finding actually is, yeah, maybe the mean achievement is higher, when you let teachers choose, but it doesn't get harder. In fact, it gets a little easier to see which teachers are struggling and, and which teachers aren't. 
So just a quick summary. Uh, I want to start by showing you what I mean by the point about adding a second observer increases reliability twice as much. So um, the first bar here reports the reliability you'd get if you just had one observation by your own school administrator. In that circumstance, only about 51% of the variance that you see in scores is due to consistent aspects of a teacher's practice. The rest is due to differences in rate or judgment and differences in a teacher's practice from lesson to lesson. So one observation by a school administrator, even if that administrator is trained, is not going to generate high levels of reliability. Only about half of the variance you see is attributable to consistent aspects of, of a teacher's practice. Now, suppose that you add a second observation by the same observer. You would boost reliability um, from 0.51 to, um, to 0.58. That's a 7. 0.07 boost in reliability by adding a second observation by the same observer. Now what do you get if you had that second observation done by a different observer? There you boost reliability from 0.51 to 0.67. So the increase is 0.16 in reliability, which is more than twice the boost in reliability that you get from having the same observer observe a second time. Now, this has important implications. Not, by the way, the, the second two bars need not cost any differently, right? All we're saying is, in, for, the, uh, for that third bar, do tag team. If you're going to have one set of observers it's silly to have one observer watch one set of teachers and another observer watch um, a different set of teachers. If they're each doing two observations, you could increase reliability just by having them switch up and have one observer do one set of one observation for all the teachers and have the other observer do one observation for all of the teachers. Okay. Now, we also just show in the report what kinds of reliability would you get with different combinations. Um, so the blue uh, dots represent okay, observations by peers. Um, the Mercedes-Benz-like uh, symbol there represents three short observations by, by peers. So, you can get um, reliability of 0.67 just by a single observation by an administrator and then three short observations by peers. There are lots of other things you can do though. You could have two full observations by the same peer. Um, gives you 0.66. Having two full observations by different peers as well as two observations by school principals, you get 0.69. The last one, with the same amount of observation time, but where you have two observations by an the same administrator, one full observation by a peer, and then three short observations by different peers, and that one you get reliability 0.72. Now, I'm not saying in this that there's some magic level of reliability that you're shooting for. More reliability uh, is better. And so, for the same number of observations, you can get more reliability by, having, um, by just having more than one observer rather than increasing the number of observations per observer. And in the report, we just report what we got with just various combinations of those. In this report, we don't identify one best way to do it. Rather, our goal was simply to describe the trade-offs involved in deciding on the weights. So when you're choosing uh, weights, there are three, at least three different things. We actually, there were three things we could measure that, um, that a state might want to consider when it's choosing which weights um, uh, to 
use to combine observations, student surveys, and, and student achievement gains. One consideration is, okay, how well is this measure correlated with a teacher's likely future student achievement gains on the state test? That's one criterion. The second one is, okay, what would be a correlation between this combined measure and student achievement gains on other tests? So, so we were in a unique position in this project because we had these student achievement gains on other tests. So we could say, how does your correlation with these other tests change depending on the amount of weight that you put on the state test and the classroom observations in the student survey? So that's a, that's a trade-off that, that we can illustrate. And the third is, what's the reliability for the combined measure? So how much would things bounce around from year to year? And so in this report, we illustrate just what, just the magnitude of those trade-offs, and I'll show you in a second. So th the first one is, first finding is, when the goal is simply to identify teachers who will produce large gains on state tests, um, the best predictor um, is to attach 65 to 90 percent of the weight on achievement gains on the state tests. But more balanced weights, so weights that don't put 65 to 90 percent of the gains on the state test, but spread the, the weight out across the classroom observation and the student survey, offer two benefits. Um, they offer better ability to predict other outcomes, and they offer somewhat you know, higher um, reliability or less volatility from year to year. Mostly, by the way, this improved reliability comes from the student survey um, um, component. Third, but student achievement on the state test should not be weighted too lightly because if you go too far in downweighting student achievement gains on the state test, not only do you lose correlation with state tests, but you also lose on the other outcomes that you care about. You actually have, are somewhat less highly correlated with achievement gains on these supplemental assessments, and there's somewhat less reliability. As with anything, um, there are diminishing returns to lowering the weight on the state test. After a point, actually, you're worse off on all three measures if you continue to, to downweight the, the state test too much. All right, so to illustrate this, um, we, we uh, worked through four different models. Model one was, is the model that um, best predicts student achievement gains on the state test. So if your goal, and by the way, this is just for middle school English language arts. So if your goal is to identify teachers who are going to see big achievement gains on the state test, you'd put 81% of the weight on, um, on the value added on the state test, you'd put 17% of the weight on the student surveys, and you'd put 2% of the weight on the observations. Model two is suppose that you're, um, suppose you wanted to try out some more balanced weights. You'd put, so we said, okay, let's try out a couple of different more balanced approaches. And again, we're going to, we know it's going to be less highly correlated with the state test, but we're going to see what are the other benefits that you get from moving towards these more balanced approaches. So one of the models we tested was, say you put 50% on a value added on the state test, 25-25 on the other two components. The third model we tested was a third, a third, a third. Suppose you weight state test a third, student surveys a third, classroom observations a third. And model four is going to the other extreme. It's saying, suppose you put 50% on the observations, and just 25 on the state test, 25 on the student survey. 
So what do you see? So remember that Model 1, Model 2, Model 3, Model 4, they correspond with, um, with the, the colors now, the bars in, in this graph. The first group of bars says, what happens to the correlation with state test gains when you move from Model 1 to Model 2 to Model 3 to Model 4? So as you, as you move away from the model that, that was designed to do the best job of predicting achievement gains on the state tests, the correlation with the state test gains goes down. That shouldn't be a surprise. We sort of set it up to say, okay, well, how, what's the best you could do in terms of correlation? And then we say, when you move away from that, what are the costs? So this is just showing what, what is the cost in terms of correlation with state test gains. And that correlation goes from 0.69 to 0.63 to 0.53 to 0.43 in model four. Now, the second thing is to say, well, what happens to the correlation with the tests of higher order you know, conceptual skills? Well, at first, the correlation goes up a bit. Again, this is middle school ELA, but I, you know, the pattern is generally similar in other grades and subjects, and in the technical report, you'll see the results for other grades and subjects. But at first, the correlation goes up a bit and then starts to go down. What happens in terms of reliability? Well, there too, reliability tends to go up as you move from Model 1 to Model 2 to Model 3. Again, that's primarily because as you move across those models, you're putting more and more weight on the student surveys, which um, in our results had among the, the highest uh, reliability. But then when you go from Model 3 to Model 4, reliability starts to decline. Okay, so this, these sets of results hopefully lead to a, a more reasoned debate about just what are the trade-offs involved in making these choices around, um, around the weights to use. Do you want to use either one of the extremes or do you want to use um, one of the more balanced approaches um, in, in the middle? The last issue I want to talk about, because I, I know this is going to be a, a debate that we're going to have in the coming months, and that is, can the measures be used for high stakes purposes for individual teachers? It's, it's a valid question, but one thing it misses is it fails to ask, okay, but wait a minute, what about the mistakes we're already making? And to make that concrete, um, I think it's useful to think of three different scenarios. One from the perspective of a teacher, another from the perspective of a principal, and a third from a perspective of a superintendent or, or even a, a, a policy maker. So in scenario one, suppose you've been teaching biology for 10 years and you want to improve your practice. What weaknesses should you focus on and how will you know if you're making progress? Well, in the absence of these measures, what do we have to say to that teacher? I think all we can say right now is you're on your own. Like, here, here's some great instructional materials. Good luck, hope you use them well. These measures would help provide, particularly the student surveys and the classroom observation, would help you identify what are some pieces of my practice that I might be able to work on, and where do I stand relative to, to, to my peers? Scenario two, a probationary, you're, say you're a principal and a probationary teacher in your school is approaching the end of their second year. If you retain the teacher, he or she automatically earns tenure under the collective bargaining agreement. Should you grant tenure or recruit a new novice teacher? Now, this one is, in a, is probably the most per, tough decision of, the, of, of all three because you've got limited data. You, just, you have to make a decision after two years. But the point is you can't avoid making the decision because if, if you, there's, we tend to focus on what are the costs of a mistake for the teacher who's been there for two years. 
but we're forgetting about what are the costs of a mistake for the students for the next 25 years. So if you're gonna, you know, I, I, despite the fact that my favorite college football team was massacred last night, I'm, <laughs> I'm a college uh, sports fan, and, um, or in a professional sports fan, and I think of the case of a coach who says, okay, I'm in effect giving up 25 years of draft picks every time I grant tenure to a teacher at the end of two years. That's the standard. And actually, if this teacher is performing below the average novice teacher, I'm in effect saying I'm willing to take lower achievement next year to avoid potentially making a, a, a mistake with this teacher. So when we think about mistakes, we got to make sure that we think about the, the costs of those mistakes for the students, but also the costs of any mistake that we might make here for, remember, there's another teacher that would get hired in this scenario. So presumably, they'd be happy to get a job. So, so there are a number of potential mistakes that be, could be made here, and there's more than just that particular teacher involved. And again, I'd argue that even if these measures aren't perfect, better information will lead to better decisions and fewer mistakes, not, not more mistakes. Third, suppose you're a superintendent. And your district is, you know, considering offering, offering coaching opportunities, which come along with higher pay to a subset of teachers. Should you, one, allocate those slots on the basis of seniority, or ensure that only excellent instructors uh, are, are coaches? And how would you measure effectiveness fairly? Now, in, we, by the way, we did some of those earlier charts that I just showed in the previous slide where, where I showed how did each of those composite measures correlated with, correlate with student achievement gains on the state tests and student achievement gains on the supplemental assessments. And we looked at how well you could do with master's degrees and experience. And the correlation was just about, you know, one-third to one quarter is large on every outcome except reliability. So on correlation with the state test, correlation with the supplemental test. Ironically, master's degrees and experience is pretty high reliability because you, you can measure those things fairly well. It's just that they aren't very correlated with these other things. And in fact, every outcome that we looked at was more related to this composite measure than master's degrees and experience. And that's the thing it's that comparison, it's, the, it's, it's how, are these new, how do these new measures compare to the measures that we're already using for, for high stakes decision that we sh should be thinking about. So high stakes decisions are being made now with little or no data, and we need to keep that in mind whenever we think about uh, whether or not uh, these measures are, are, are ready to be used for high stakes decisions themselves. And second, no information is perfect, but better information should lead to better decisions and, and fewer mistakes, not more uh, mistakes. So I know I've sort of just briefly touched on some of the key findings in these three reports, but thanks again. I think we've made um, uh, a lot of progress in the last few years. There's still work to be done, but it, it's important to recognize uh, we really have learned what are some of the key elements in doing this right. And, um, and I'm, I'm sure we're gonna uh, learn some more in the coming years, but we can't underestimate the importance of that. Thanks. <laughs>